Welcome to Charity Village Connects. Today we're exploring the potential impacts of Bill S216 on the nonprofit sector and how the proposed bill could change the way charities are able to work with frontline community groups that don't have charitable status. Joining me today is Kathy Taylor, Executive Director of ONN, the Ontario Nonprofit Network. ONN activates a provincial network to develop and analyze policy and work on strategic issues through working groups, sector engagement, and government relations. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. Kathy, I wonder if you could provide some background information on Bill S216 and why your organization supports the bill. Mm -hmm. It's such a good question. Uh, so ONN definitely supports the bill, S216, which is the Effective and Accountable Charities Act, which you may know Senator Ratna Ahmedvar um, uh, introduced in November of 2021. And what the bill does, it amends the Income Tax Act to include charities and allow them to establish equal partnerships with non-charities while still ensuring accessibility, transparency and accountability. And the big reason we support this act, and it's something we've been working on for over 10 years, is because um, direction and control, um, that terminology is part of the Income Tax Act, which until now has said that charities can only work with and fund non-charities if they have direction and control over their own activities. Um, so this requirement significantly hinders how partnerships happen at the community level, internationally, as well as domestically here in Canada. Um, and partnerships, as you know, are key to making sure that we're meeting the needs of our communities, um, whether they're the needs of our uh, vulnerable communities, our racialized communities, um, the needs of our sports, our arts, culture, social service communities. We want to be able to co-create solutions at the local level with, with the citizens and organizations that are passionate about what they're, what they're doing. So we've had a long policy priority around shared um, this concept of getting rid of direction and control to allowing for the concept of what we call shared platforms, um, which is really enabling charities to provide a platform or support for unincorporated grassroots and projects and initiatives to really allow communities to identify what their needs and aspirations are and to use the charitable model in the way that we believe it was intended. So I guess the barrier, as I understand it, is, um, you know, it's, it's very old uh, legislation uh, the act actually requires a, quite a complex sort of process. This is what I've been told by advocates for the bill that actually um, dis, uh, disincentivizes a lot of charities to actually work with non-charitable um, donees or I guess unqualified donees, uh, organizations that aren't actually charities. And, and that's what I understand part of the problem is. It, 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 am I correct in that? You're absolutely correct. So that really the big problem is that the Income Tax Act and, and the resulting charitable regulations and guidances um, really say that a charity has to um, use its own object, it, that anything the charity does, of course, has to be attached to its charitable activities, and that it must have direction and control over everything it does. So imagine for a moment, if an organization is supporting the development of an initiative in their community, they can't possibly direct and control you know, every bit and piece of, of that project or initiative in their community. And so charities are reluctant to enter these relationships because they're fearful that they could lose their charitable status. And grassroots projects and initiatives, they're not ready to register as a charity. Um, and maybe they're not even, you know, a, ch a charity is not where they should be going if they just might have a creative project that might be short term or they might have an activity that they, they, want, to, they want to conduct. So it really puts both charities and the and the, the grassroots um, projects at a at a risk. Um, so getting rid of that direction and control, allowing charities to partner equally and more effectively with those organizations and people that are working on the ground would actually be a huge um, benefit to our communities. So I, I understand advocates for the bill emphasize its social justice aspects, as it would be opening up funding to organizations and movements. Uh, who may not have the resources to pursue charitable status, or as you point out, uh, it, it may not be an appropriate kind of structure for them. Um, can you comment on these uh, social justice aspects as you see it? Mm -hmm, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt that the concept of direction and control, first of all, the Income Tax Act and charity law in Canada is very old, like hundreds of years old, you know, grounded in, in, in laws from the British colonies. 
it's very hierarchical, it's very colonial, and it implies that community-led grassroots initiatives don't know what's best for their communities. That somebody else, usually white-led, uh, larger organizations, they're the ones that have the power and the decision-making. So in addition to that, registering and operating a charity is a lot of work. I mean, I've, I have done it. Uh, it's onerous. It takes time away from mission-focused work. So if you're really focusing on you know, the mission work that you want to do. Combined with that, I think there's growing evidence that um, that Black-led and Indigenous-led and focused organizations are not getting, they're underfunded or unfunded. They're not getting the resources they need. There's lots of reports in the last couple of years that really point to that. So allowing charities to partner with non-qualified donees, allowing them to support the emergence of leadership in the Black, Indigenous, uh, and racialized communities really allows that critical infrastructure to grow and develop um, and gives opportunities to be able to test whether those ideas and projects and communities are ready to be a registered charity. Perhaps they're not, uh, and, and that's okay. It's not, a, it's not a spectrum of, you know, yes, a charity or, or not a charity. Um, but we really hope that by removing direction and control provisions and expanding this concept of chairs, shared platforms, that would enable more organizations um, that, that have equity-seeking um, organizations involved or really support equity-seeking missions and visions will be able to uh, do more work and achieve more in their communities. But I would say, you know, I think it's so important that we recognize that for Black and Indigenous uh, and racialized organizations, shared platforms and even even removing this, we still exist in a in a system of, of colonial oppression and legacies still exist. And it's going to take us a long time and lots of intention around re reciprocity and really building relationships to support um, to support those communities. Well, you you raise this point, and I think it's an important one. I've heard from um, critics of the bill, or at least the intention of the bill, or the um, I guess the um, effectiveness of the bill is that you know even under existing systems, the existing law, um, uh, there are um, black charities and there are black led uh, indigenous charities that could easily be um, you know worked with by larger charities or foundations and that, you know, they simply aren't getting the funding and it may have a lot to do with systemic issues and not so much about the existing uh, Income Tax Act. What, what do you say about those sorts of observations? Oh, it's absolutely true. I think um, there's so many pieces to this puzzle that we need to solve in order to be an equity, what we would call an equity responsive sector. You know, we all have individual work to do as organizations, but from a public policy and systemic issue, you know, there's no doubt that organizations that serve Black, Indigenous and racialized populations have been underfunded. Changing direction and control won't change that overnight. You know, it's one aspect, you know, one piece of the puzzle. Um, but have it, encouraging philanthropy and governments to invest in organizations to take a different approach to how funding even happens, to think about how their grant making practices, you know, really are rooted in colonial systems. Um, there's lots of work that we all need to do. So it, it is not a one, um, you know, this one thing will not change the landscape uh, on its own. I'd like to hear from a more localized area because you do represent organizations in Ontario. How do you see the bill impacting your member organizations on, in Ontario particularly? What do you think are the important aspects of the bill? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think it'll impact um, sort of both sides of the coin if, if, you, um, if you see it that way. The organizations that are interested in supporting uh, or grassroots initiatives and projects. So the established charities, um, they are keen to share their skills and infrastructure. We have lots of examples of organizations that provide that kind of support and want to do more of it that are worried about risking their charitable status. So giving them that kind of clarity so that they can, they know that it's okay. It's, you know, it's on the right side of the ledger to be able to provide um, that kind of support without having to follow difficult direction and control rules uh, is going to be very beneficial um, to those organizations. And on the flip side in Ontario, especially in the pandemic, we saw a huge influx of community-based grassroots initiatives, uh, 
really designed and created to support communities where they were at in the moment. Uh, and we, some folks call those mutual aid networks, some, you know, just neighborhood groups. Uh, but there's, there's so many ways that we can support and harness that talent and energy. And so we really see that this bill will have a huge impact, uh, particularly in Ontario. Well, I want to move on to something a little more broad based in a, in a sense of some of the work that ONN does. Your organization released several reports throughout the COVID-19 pandemic that were so uh, critical for our understanding uh, and basically to take a pulse check on how nonprofit organizations in Ontario were faring. Can you discuss some of the main findings and in particular whether government supports at the provincial or federal level were sufficient for nonprofits in Ontario during this very, very difficult time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Carol, uh, Mary. It was such a difficult time in the last two and a half years and continues to be, frankly, for, for nonprofits and charities that serve their communities. Um, we did three surveys uh, in the COVID period, um, the last one released in August of 2021. And we're actually uh, uh, going out into the field next week for uh, sort of a hopefully the last of the COVID surveys to get a sense where people are at uh, in 2022. But I can tell you that there was similar similar themes throughout the surveys, but particularly the last one we did, a couple of things were really clear. So the demand for services was far greater than it had ever been. So demand was up even for organizations, not just for social services and health organizations, but for sport and recreation organization, organizations that did arts and culture and environmental programs and family visiting. So overall, the demand for services, what communities were asking for, you know, through the roof. At the same time, revenue decreased. Fundraising revenue was down. Uh, there might have been an early blip with some online donations. But because for two years, there haven't been fundraising events, golf tournaments, auctions, galas, all of those things. Um, revenue was down. Government revenue was stagnant. It did not grow during this period of time. And then the third thing we learned uh, loud and clear was that the, there is a pending uh, human resource and volunteer crisis. So volunteer numbers dropped during the pandemic for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, not a, it wasn't a safe place to volunteer in many locations. A lot of our volunteers are seniors. Um, so seniors, uh, of course, weren't, weren't um, very cautious of volunteering during the pandemic. And then, you know, the issue around staffing right now, it's the number one issue in our sector in terms of being able to recruit and retain the staff that we need to provide services. So those were the themes that we heard through the surveys. We continue to hear anecdotally. Um, but I can tell you that from the, we asked specific questions about provincial and federal government supports. And what I can tell you is that uh, if you had staff um, the federal wage subsidy was helpful to many organizations that had paid staff, which is about half of the sector. Half of the sector is completely volunteer driven. So if you had paid staff, the wage subsidy um, was often helpful. Uh, but of course, that's run out now. The rent subsidy was not very helpful to our sector. And a lot of the other programs that for small businesses that this nonprofit sector was eligible for, they either didn't know about or didn't access. So overall, um, we asked we asked our respondents to rate how the provincial and federal responses were to supporting the sector. They were rated very low, very low, um, and we did not see the support um, that we needed to see. There was some emergency funding available here and there. There were some pockets of targeted funding, so for tourism organizations or for you know arts organizations that for sure were helpful. But neither at the provincial level or the federal level were, were there any kind of stabilization funding available, despite calls by all the advocates for that. There has been a campaign in recent years for a so-called home in government for the nonprofit sector at the federal level. Um, uh, and certainly uh, there's been even some provincial movements in that way as well. Um, can you discuss your organization's support of this campaign and what it would mean to organizations in your province, especially perhaps if there had been a home in government um, during the pandemic, we would have seen better a better response from the federal government and even provincial government to supporting um uh, to supporting the sector during this time when there was such increased demand and 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 they were so hard hit, um, you know, do you think it would have made a difference? Mm -hmm. 
I do. I actually, I fundamentally believe it would have made a big difference. I think uh, to have a home in government really means a department, a secretariat or a ministry that's responsible for a championing the issues at a cabinet level or at a senior level that they hear um, in this case from the nonprofit sector and also playing a coordinating role across ministries, um, whether it's department of labor that might deal with uh, Statistics Canada or, um, you know, other departments, Department of Finance, Department that's responsible for heritage and things like that. So I do think that one of the dilemmas we had both provincially and federally during the pandemic was that there was no single place to go to advocate for what we were hearing that the sector needed. So in Ontario, for example, we work with 16 ministries, separate ministries, separate ministers offices, separate public servants on issues that you know range from police records checks to you know labor market data to transfer payment reform and grants and contributions and no one has the overall responsibility to think about the health and well-being of the sector as a whole they're all very focused you know as their ministry or department is on a specific slice of that so not having anyone either politically or bureaucratically that actually has a mandate to think about the overall health and well-being of the sector is an enormous gap. And when you see how other industries are able to get that kind of support, because they do have that. And my best example in Ontario is that they, there is an associate minister for small business. And during the pandemic, that minister had an advisory committee of small businesses giving him advice on what the small business community needed. And we were missing, you know, we were missing that key piece. And to their credit, the Ontario government invited ONN to sit at that table. So we were able to provide some input. Uh, but as one of many small businesses, um, there wasn't a, a specific advisory uh, table of any sort for the nonprofit and charitable sector. So I think we missed out on huge opportunities and had to really fight for to make sure that the wage subsidy, for example, imagine Canada fought hard to make sure that charities and nonprofits were included in the wage subsidy um, and the rent subsidy. And, you know, we really had to fight our way in rather than have, you know, have that champion, uh, have that data we needed to quickly have a mechanism to have conversations and to convene the sector. Um, so I, I think it would make an enormous difference. We're very uh, supportive of a federal home and government campaign. Um, and think it's complementary to having a provincial um, a provincial home and government as well. Well, we recently spoke with the Parliamentary Secretary for Community Development and Nonprofits in British Columbia, which is the first province to have such a position within the provincial government. Has there been any movement on creating a similar position within the provincial government of Ontario? Um, and uh, you've spoken a bit about the advantages that you would foresee, but um, you know, going forward in the future, what kind of advantages would you have, and and what is the status of any kind of advocacy in that in that score? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We also had the privilege of speaking to the parliamentary secretary Nikki Sharma in BC and, and learning from her and sharing what was happening in Ontario. Uh, and I I can tell you, you know, they just got BC just got an announcement of thirty thirty million dollars in funding support. And largely it's because they have an advocate, you know, within government and a champion at the cabinet table. So that's a really tangible example of the benefit of having, uh, you know, having that sort of uh, home in government or in the U.S. There's a campaign called seat at the table. So very similar, very similar concept. Um, you know, I think so in Ontario, we have not had a, a department or a minister responsible for quite some time. A number of years ago, there, the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration did have the nonprofit sector and volunteerism as part of their portfolio. Um, but we haven't had that for quite some time. And uh, so it is actually one of ONN's election asks as we head into the June um, 2022 provincial election here in Ontario. And we've been meeting with parties, uh, all four parties in Ontario. We've been meeting with candidates and they're very intrigued, I must say, all of them. Uh, cross party lines about the concept of what that would look like um, and how that could be helpful both to government as well as to the nonprofit sector. So we uh, we are actively promoting the, the concept of a home and government. We're actually working on doing some of our own research to think about, you know, what could the model look like? You know, it could look like a, a parliamentary assistant or an associate minister or a secretariat or there's many models out there. So we're doing our homework. 
to look at other jurisdictions and see what you know what might be the the right model for the the moment in Ontario. But what we know already is we we need political leadership and we need to make sure that there's a connection with the public service so there's a department or a budget associated. So it's not just political leadership and it's not just a you know a, a department. There's there's a real integration of of those two things and we know that that's what leads to success. We'll, we'll, we'll be watching the election very closely for that then. Um, I've heard from some critics of the idea of a home in government, uh, which suggests that it might be a problem of putting all the eggs in one basket for the sector and that having just one department to turn to uh, and be a funnel, essentially, actually may, may make for more limited advocacy efforts, especially if the ministerial appointment was not knowledgeable about or overly supportive of the sector. What are your thoughts on that? And what do you feel the pros uh, outweigh the cons? Mm -hmm. I do feel the pros outweigh the cons for a couple of reasons. One, I think we can all agree that the sector government relationship needs to transform. You know, it is not working um, and we do need different ways and different avenues and transformation to do that. And and I think there's many ways to do that and, and there's no single way. I also think that um, a home and government having a department or a cross-sector um, table or organization will not change the fact that individual nonprofits and their subsectors have relationships with other ministries. So, for example, it won't change the fact that community health centers work with the Ministry of Health or that sports and tourism organizations work with the Ministry of Culture, Tourism and Sport. Those relationships, those funding relationships, those specific relationships to their subsector needs, that's critically important. And it won't replace that at all. But what it will do is elevate all of the issues that nonprofits and charities, regardless of geography, regardless of their size or what their, you know, what their subsector or mission are, that we all have in common. So things like data and labor force and how government grants are done. Um, all of those things to create an enabling environment for all of us will have a will have somewhere that we can advocate that we can work with on that level because individual ministries and individual departments often tell us well that's really interesting but you know we're really focused on this aspect you know our our mandate is only x y or z um, so until we have someone that has that broader health and well-being of the sector as their mandate, we won't be getting some of the big transformational change that we really want to see. Well, uh, since we're talking um, about advocacy, I'd like to take a look at the bigger picture. How do you feel the nonprofit sector could improve in terms of advocacy with government at all levels? I've, I've certainly spoken to some people who feel that uh, in many respects, some of the leadership of organizations feel too vulnerable um, because of their dependence on government funding to be able to advocate, um, you know, uh, assertively without hurting potentially um, a revenue source, for example, uh, or some, uh, you know, political contacts. Um, I wonder what, what your thoughts are around that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's always work to be done in our sector to be comfortable and develop the skills for advocacy, for sure. And, and you know, we've tried to create some tools and, and training and, and things on how to advocate as a sector. Um, but a, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, that um, organizations, uh, individual organizations can always be vulnerable if they're advocating to a funder or to uh, to someone that that may have you know regular regulatory control over something that they're doing so the power of collective advocacy of networked advocacy whether it's at a local level with a group of organizations in a geographic community or or whether it's at a subsector level like all of the you know all of the organizations that provide food bank services or food security get together or at a provincial level like with ONN is really valuable because it takes the risk off of an individual organization. So I would say the more that we do collective advocacy, the more that we prioritize, you know, those top few things that we all agree on, um, the more successful we will be. And that doesn't mean that individual organizations still can't advocate for the things that they want to see for their own organization or for their own community. But I think we do need to identify some of those big priorities that we have uh, and and have share the you know share our key messages, sing from the same songbook, so that when we're all talking to elected officials and and public servants, that we're all saying the same thing. 
And so there's a big opportunity for us to do definitely do a lot more of that. Uh, I also think that the rules around advocacy, the lobbying registrations we have, the Election Financing Act, um, they are problematic. They do put the chill and fear in organizations and their boards of directors. And so we have to continue to advocate that it's okay for charities and nonprofits to be advocates. It's not okay to be partisan, but it's okay to advocate for public policy. In fact, if you're if you're doing food security work, who better to advocate for food security issues? Because you know the issues on the ground. And nonprofits and charities are really that bridge between communities and government. And so we actually have a, a, a really important role to play in advocacy. So we do have to make sure that those rules don't scare people away at the same time as encourage, encourage organizations to develop the skills and see advocacy as fundamentally one of the core strategies to meet their mission. Uh, really well said. I would love to hear from you what you think the top, say, three or four, whatever you think you'd like to limit it to, what are the top advocacy issues you see as being most important to the sector in the coming year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, number one, for sure, is staffing and volunteerism, like our labor force crisis, uh, being able to create decent work for, for our workers to be able to make sure that um, there's wage parity between our sector and public and private sectors to fill the gaps that are happening. A huge issue for our sector to recover from this pandemic. So we need better labor market information. We be, need better wages. We need all of those things that contribute to a healthy labor market because it, at the end of the day, our sector is driven by people. It's the people that do the work and we really need to support to support our people. So for us, that's number one. Uh, I think number two is around, you know, financing and finances and transfer payment agreements. There's so much to be done to improve how the sector is financed. Um, grant making uh, did improve over the pandemic. Lots of grant makers were quick out the gate, less reporting, you know, quicker decisions. Um, so what did we learn from the pandemic that we can apply going forward to be able to be nimble and supportive and to encourage more grant makers and governments to do longer term granting, granting that includes general operating expenses and technology, for example, which was such a problem during the pandemic that organizations didn't have technology. Um, and then I would say the last one would be really around ensuring that the nonprofit sector is well positioned. There's going to be other crises. There have been whether it's environmental forest fires and floods, whether it's a pandemic, uh, to learn from our experiences, to uh, figure out what we need to be resilient going forward, whether it's technology or our people, um, to really advocate for the sector to be part of the conversations on what we learned from the pandemic and help prepare us for whatever, whatever the next uh, crisis might be. And if I could add a fourth, I would say, you know, the nonprofit business model we know that uh, when, the not, when services are delivered, especially in the care economy, so childcare, long-term care, not affordable housing, by nonprofits, more government investment stays within communities. You know, it's not going to shareholders. There's better outcomes, you know, the nonprofit long-term care outcomes versus for-profit long-term care outcomes during the pandemic were quite stark. So we really have a priority to make sure that governments understand the nonprofit business model, the advantages to it, and to you know take profit out of care, so that uh, so that our communities are best served by organizations in their community. Well, I want to thank you, Kathy, for your wisdom and insights into Bill S two hundred and sixteen and its potential impact on the nonprofit sector across Canada, and your very eloquent discussion about the importance of advocacy and the ways that nonprofits and uh, charities across Canada, and particularly Ontario, can uh, uh, bring their voices together to help make positive change. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you were able to join us, and uh, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you, Mary. It was a pleasure.